Director of Conservation Planning and Ecosystem Management for NatureServe, and I'll be joined a little later by Ian Barley, who is one of our conservation planners in our NatureServe VISTA DSS Program Manager. Um, I struggled a bit with the title on this. Um, the, this presentation, uh, variations of it in training have been given a few times now, um, but what I was trying to indicate here is that through our experience, the good news is um, that things we've been hearing in the literature about uh, it's best to try and integrate climate change um, effects uh, along with uh, analyzing all other stressor impacts um, and integrating adaptive planning in with your other planning um, it is good guidance and it seems to work uh, and makes sense. It's not to say there aren't uh, some novel aspects of climate change vulnerability uh, assessment and adaptation planning. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of those, but uh, for the most part we're going to focus on how we can integrate uh, at least direct climate change effects into uh, pretty traditional scenario-based approaches for assessment and planning. So a uh, brief agenda, we'll be giving some background on the framework. Um, overviewing that framework, providing some details of this, the six steps of the framework, with some examples from some pilot projects. We're going to intersperse that with a, some live demo from our NatureServe Vista software, some uh, coastal projects, um, and then we'll have some wrap-up and discussion as desired. And Patrick, if you could speak up, there's a couple people who are having trouble uh, hearing you. Okay, is this better? Actually, that is much better. Well, it's clearer. Okay. Still I'll, speaking uh, up just... is good, but that, that is clearer. Okay. Um, so uh, let me talk a bit about the origins of this uh, framework. First of all, um, we have this thing called the Refuge Vulnerability Assessment Framework. Um, it's being developed as a cooperative agreement with Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's resulting in a guidance handbook as part of the series of handbooks that guide development of comprehensive conservation plans for uh, National Fish and Wildlife Service refuges. Um, a few years ago, we worked with the Mission Aransas uh, National Estuarine Research Reserve, as well as NOAA, um, Placeways, um, and some others on an integrated land sea planning approach and toolkit, and that resulted in uh, development of a technical guidebook that you can uh, get at through the ebmtools.org website. Uh, NatureServe and others have also been working on um, some guidance to proactively integrate conservation into the transportation long-range planning process, and that resulted in a cumulative effects assessment and alternatives uh, framework and technical guidance. And then uh, several years of methodology work to develop our NatureServe VISTA decision support system. So all of these things contributed to the work that I'm going to be showing you with Ian today. Uh, there is jargon, of course. Uh, first thing I wanted to cover is we'll use the term mitigation um, as it's traditionally been used uh, in terms of the mitigation hierarchy, not in terms of reduction of carbon when we think about climate change. Um, we'll also be using mitigation interchangeably with climate adaptation, viewing climate adaptation actions as a subset of mitigation. Uh, a resource. Um, also used alternatively with the term element in our presentation is really any feature that you want to assess, retain, or plan around. And then retention goal is the percent or amount of a resource that you wish to retain under any uh, current or future scenario that you want to evaluate. I'll get to some scenarios uh, shortly. Uh, so this framework, what is it? Um, primarily it's a spatially enabled process, but not exclusively. Um, but what does it do? So it identifies resources of concern, identifies the key stressors, including effects of climate change, conducts cumulative effects assessments under multiple scenarios, rapidly develops response strategies and optional management scenarios, and then facilitates cooperative planning with partners in other sectors throughout the landscape. What is it based on? Well, several well-established concepts, things that we did not create from whole cloth, but um, we've put them together. So the first is vulnerability assessment. So that's answering questions about what resources might be vulnerable, um, in particular under scenarios of climate change. 
cumulative effects assessment that's going to integrate climate effects with other stressors on the landscape to understand uh, how that synergy among those things may affect our resources. Uh, the mitigation hierarchy, again, not climate uh, usage, but talking about the hierarchy of avoid, minimize, restore, and offset. And then systematic conservation planning. Um, I think most people are probably familiar with that, but using concepts like irreplaceability and complementarity. As well as, finally, ecosystem-based management and adaptive management. So ecosystem-based management, taking a holistic approach, recognizing humans in the landscape, um, and also adaptive management, which is going to be focused on learning while applying um, our planning as we go, understanding that there is a lot of uncertainty about what really is going to happen and how effective, uh, in particular, some uh, climate adaptation strategies might end up being. So let's dig into the framework a bit and get into the process workflow. Um, again, Again, some jargon. I mentioned scenarios. Um, so scenarios are uh, things that you want to compare your resource objectives against. And your resource objectives are primarily the, the quantities of your resources uh, in adequate condition. And as scenarios can be represented um, through a time series or alternatives. So we usually begin with a current or what we call a baseline scenario. We may have a forecast scenario that could have forecasts of urbanization. Um, as well as certainly climate change, we can have proposed scenarios. So those would be uh, proposed, say, large infrastructure or renewable energy scenarios. These are typically done in a time series, and they are cumulative. So we're going to begin with that, that uh, current scenario, and then we're going to build our future scenarios by adding uh, forecasts and proposed uh, stressors to that current baseline. All right, so process workflow. Um, I've tried to avoid uh, animation because I know that can get a little kludgy on these uh, webinars, but to, in this case, I wanted to be able to step through this one step at a time. Um, so one thing we're not going to address in this are these collaborative processes along the side. Those are all of the things necessary to really get a project up and running. We're going to begin with uh, that work uh, having been done, and we're going to begin with scope. And so this is uh, talking about things like what's the policy framework you're working under, what are the key resources and issues and priorities uh, that you and your stakeholders would have in mind. That moves on to step two where we need to inventory uh, our data available to address those things. Might include also some uh, generation of data and modeling to make more out of the data that we have. That's going to move on to step three, which is mapping cumulative scenarios. Um, again, time series and alternative futures. Step four evaluates the scenario effects. So looking at resource goal achievement gaps and identifying uh, what are the key stressors causing um, uh, loss of our resources or damage to our resources, and where are the locations where uh, that effect is happening. Step five looks at the results from our evaluation and develops strategies. These aren't maps or plans yet. These are, are typically written strategies uh, for mitigation adaptation. Um, and it may also include changing our priorities for things that we can't uh, do anything to solve. Step six, then, is where we are looking at uh, informing alternatives, um, particularly uh, developing spatial maps of alternative future scenarios where we're addressing our stressors um, to the degree possible. And it can also include some non-spatial actions. There's a lot of interconnectedness among these things, a lot of feedbacks, um, in some cases uh, revisiting priorities or going back and redoing some data inventory or data generation. So I won't step through those, but just indicating that those uh, feedbacks do exist. Um, and then finally, we're going to export our alternatives out to various planning processes. And I'll talk more about this later, but it's the idea of really thinking about multiple sectors collaborating get together on this work. And then finally, we are going to cycle back um, to um, our scoping, you know, thinking about this being a process that would be repeated uh, every so often um, in our work for Fish and Wildlife Service. They have a formal process of repeating or updating their 
comprehensive plans every 15 years, for example. But um, the pace of climate change may certainly indicate working through some of these processes on a more frequent basis. So that was the process workflow. Right now what I'd like to do is talk about the actual information workflow. And again, across the top we have a context of time available, funding available, what is the geography we're working in, uh, policy frameworks, data availability, leadership, current ongoing efforts we can leverage, and so on. So in that context, we're going to begin with, uh, again, the stakeholder input, um, listing out our desired resources, um, and in particular, um, say, critical infrastructure uh, that we would like to, to assess. Again, that's going to be done in the context often of regulatory requirements. That's going to lead to a list of um, infrastructure that is current proposed plan or forecast, um, as well as candidate resources for assessment. Moving on, um, from our list of infrastructure, we're going to select critical infrastructure. And right now, I just want to explain what I'm talking about is primarily from our refuge vulnerability assessment uh, for the Fish and Wildlife Service refuges. Certainly, this process can be expanded out to think about other things, and I will talk about what some of those other things could be in terms of what we could, would consider a feature to be assessed. But at this point, uh, roll with me. What we're going to talk about is uh, what uh, the service calls mission critical infrastructure. You might be thinking of things like uh, hazard escape zones along the coast uh, or escape routes. And so that critical infrastructure is going to get added to our list of resources to be assessed. The rest of the infrastructure is going to move along into a list of candidate stressors um, along with a whole bunch of other things, um, management, land use, um, exotic weeds, and so on. Um, and then this is where we're bringing in our climate change effects also, both direct effects. Uh, uh, so simply, you know, the temperature is going to rise or precipitation is going to increase or decrease. Those are, are going to directly affect some of our resources, um, as well as indirect effects um, like sea level rise, for example. So those are going to combine to be our list of stressors then uh, that are going to form our assessment. And those are going to feed into our multiple scenarios of current, future plan, and forecast. Our resources come in and are intersected in with those scenarios. And we're going to conduct our vulnerability assessment using various models. With the information from our vulnerability assessment plus our regulatory framework of, of what we're allowed to do or required to do, we're going to have our list of available strategies to work with. Those strategies then um, can be used to develop alternative scenarios, again, spatial as well as non-spatial, and those are forwarded into our different sector planning processes, land use, conservation, land management, hazard planning, and so on. So I'd like to talk about tools. Now this is the EDM Tools uh, Network. Um, so uh, spatially enabled processes do require tools for a variety of things. Uh, one is gathering and managing information. Another is conducting advanced spatial analyses and modeling, allowing uh, easy repetition of what-if questions and scenarios, and facilitating work across sectors and ecosystems that tend to use uh, fairly different processes. Um, so I just want to emphasize that the complexity of this work cannot be accomplished without tools. Um, but that said, lacking data, some of the analyses must be non-spatial or partially spatially enabled. So for example, Nature serve as a spreadsheet tool called the Climate Change Vulnerability Index. Uh, that can be informed by intersecting, uh, say, species locations with climate change maps. But from then on, that becomes really an expert process of working through a guided spreadsheet uh, set of tools that help um, score species for how vulnerable they might be to climate change in the future. Um, from there, we can certainly then take that information and then spatial enable uh, some of that vulnerability assessment and adaptation planning. So, um, sorry, busy slide. I usually animate this quite a bit, um, but this is a toolkit. So, we, we definitely promote a toolkit approach. Um, what we, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just beginning with the categories on the left, we have what we would call development or planning tools for different sectors. Those are things that um, are 
handling human needs, um, but also interacting in, t in terms of contributing scenarios into assess. Um, up at the top, we have planning process tools. Those are things that can aid civic engagement, for example. On the right, we have a variety of different data and modeling tools uh, for geophysical processes and, and so on. Um, and then at the bottom, we have conservation and mitigation tools. And in the middle, we would have a framework integration tool. Um, depending on what you're doing, that might be a tool like Community Viz, where the real focus is, say, local land use planning and other tools would be feeding information into it. Um, in this case, for uh, this assessment, we're using our Nature Serve Vista software. And in these red boxes, I just want to emphasize the tool, the toolkit, really, that we're engaging um, in our current work. So we've got Vista, we have MarkSan, we have some other companion tools with Vista at the bottom. Um, we have climate change um, prediction models on the, the right. We've got uh, VDDT for uh, vegetation change modeling, and Maxent for species distribution modeling. So uh, just telling you a bit about VISTA, um, if you haven't been exposed to it before, um, our slogan is on, on the land, in the water, and anywhere on the globe. So it's pretty flexible um, in terms of geography and ecosystem types. Um, the uh, logos there across the top are the funders that have contributed over $4 million uh, to the tool's development over the last uh, 10 years. Um, so why do we think it's the right tool for this particular job? Um, first, it's a free ArcView platform extension, so uh, lots of people use ArcView. Um, it's currently on 9.3 and we're working hard to get it out on uh, 10.0 pretty soon. Um, it's a robust tool for cumulative effects assessment. That's something we put a tremendous amount of investment into. Um, it's also a framework tool for integrating information across sectors, ecosystems, um, and different sources of information. It also assists uh, through a, quite a breadth of this process from initial uh, information gathering data as well as expert knowledge through cumulative effects assessment onto developing alternatives and plans, uh, implementing your plans, and then on into adaptive management. And it also has a high level of professional engineering and a full integrated help manual, um, and we also offer uh, live tech support and training available. And uh, it's a unique in that it also has an endowment uh, to maintain it. So that's allowed us, um, even though we haven't had substantial investments the last few years, we've been able to keep up with uh, changes in the Esri platform and continue uh, making improvements to it. So moving on to details of our steps. Uh, step one. Um, as a refresher, our little bubbles up there begin with scope. And the first thing I want to talk about is determining the resources to be assessed using laws, regulations, stakeholder, and scientific input. So uh, resources really are the building block. It's what we're trying to assess. Um, and it, it can be a breadth of a lot of different things. Certainly, biodiversity is a big focus. Uh, with climate change, there's more emphasis now on, uh, I'll just call it geophysical land units. Um, I'm just talking about the, the high-level bolded categories here. Um, and so those would be uh, combinations of um, things that won't change with climate change. So landscape position, uh, superficial geology, soils, aspects, and things like that. And so these can represent important habitat niches over time. Uh, regardless of how the biological features uh, shift and move across the landscape. Uh, World Wildlife Fund calls these enduring features, which I, they, they named that before the climate change thing really uh, came on strong, um, but I think that's an especially appropriate name nowadays. Um, you can certainly bring in already identified priority uh, conservation areas. Um, you can use cultural features, things like vulnerable human populations or archaeological sites. Um, and then critical infrastructure. Uh, again, that's a formalized part of our refuge vulnerability assessment. So thinking about things like escape routes and water control structures and hospitals and, and so on. So all of those things um, can be considered resources to be assessed. Um, next thing is this um, idea of context analyses as part of our scoping. And the idea with this is to have a, uh, two contexts. One is first our ecoregion. So we're going to put um, our, our local area that we want to um, plan for um, into some sort of a regional context uh, and help identify what really should be our priority resources. And 
with uh, the refuges in particular, this was really important. The idea there was uh, that some refuges may actually have some really important resource values, but through the legislation that established them, those, those might have been overlooked. Um, their primary purpose might be uh, for uh, uh, sustaining waterfowl and, and growing waterfowl. Um, they might have some rare plant species um, there as well. So the, the idea is really to look at the proportion of different resources in an ecoregion falling uh, within a refuge or some other you know, unit like a county and identify those things that might have been overlooked that should be raised to a priority resource for assessment. Um, the next context is this what we call a supporting landscape or seascape. And this is the area within which we're going to conduct our detailed spatial analyses. So for example, mapping out our different scenarios and our resources and doing those spatial intersects and models to assess uh, cumulative effects. So just to show you some graphic examples, one of our pilots uh, with Fish and Wildlife Service is the Eastern Shore of Virginia Refuge. And um, let's see if I can just use my, uh, my mouse here. Uh, this is the Chesapeake Bay, um, in case you didn't immediately recognize that. This is what's called the Delmarva Peninsula. The little pink areas down at the tip, that's um, the refuge of interest. You can see it's, uh, this is this little island down at the tip here. So um, that's really the focus of our analysis, but um, these two county boundaries, these are political boundaries, um, so are our supporting landscape. Uh, the refuge chose to use uh, these political boundaries. And then this black outline is our ecoregion boundary that we use for our ecoregion context. Um, our other pilot for the refuge work um, is the Sheldon and Hart Mountain Refuge Complex. This is Hart Mountain. This is Sheldon. This is the state of Nevada boundary. This is California over here, and this is Oregon. So we've got our refuges as the target for planning, but then this boundary here, this pink boundary, is um, primarily made up of watersheds. That's our supporting landscape, and that's really looking at um, the, the primary area of influence for populations of species that are using the refuges, the refuges managing for them, but they use areas off refuge as well. So this is considered a reasonable area to do that detailed assessment. This larger pink bounded area is um, our ecoregion um, assessment area. So continuing on with scope, the other part of this is determining the scenarios that we're going to use for assessment. And so talking again about current, maybe an urbanization build-out forecast, or planned infrastructure, and then climate change effects maybe in, say, 20-year increments out to 2100 is, is a common thing that uh, a lot of people are doing now. Um, and so we all want to, want to also look at that and determine the feasible spatial uh, assessments we can do and identify those things that probably need to be non-spatial assessments. All right, moving on to step two. So this is all about information. So for each resource and scenario feature, we want to probably establish a, a group, expert group that can inform uh, the development of information, identifying appropriate data, and identifying data gaps and determining the feasibility to fill those data gaps. So I want to just give one example about filling a data gap. Um, this happens to be from uh, South America, um, some work that we've done. But here is our starting point, this blue uh, published range map um, for a particular species. And then we also have these dots were, which were uh, records of observations of that species in the field. So what we're after is a scale appropriate map with um, reasonable precision and accuracy that we can use for assessment and planning. Neither of these data sources we're starting off with really do the trick. So what we did was use max, maximum entropy, MaxSense software, um, and a series of data layers. Um, and then we generated, it really is a probability surface, but filtering it down to these green shaded areas representing the distribution for the species. So that now gives us something that is consistent with the range um, and the known observations, but is showing us probably where that species really does occur. All right, so moving on. Um, so continuing on with information, for the resources to be assessed, we want to work with the experts that are going to help us determine things like sensitivities, how does the resource respond to different stressors in the scenarios, 
what would be, say, a minimum current size for a habitat or a population, um, and then establishing a project retention goal, so the percent of the area of a habit that we would like to see retained over time, or say an integer, you know, number of populations, um, or it could be, you know, the, the number of scape routes that we consider adequate um, in a, uh, a hazard situation. So now that our resource information is complete, I'm going to talk about the steps of creating and evaluating the scenarios. So first, we want to map these cumulative scenarios. That's going to begin with aggregating our current scenario data. We're going to define this uh, current or baseline scenario. We're going to save that out, and then we're going to use that as a template to build our future scenarios. So we're going to add our next scenario features in terms of urban growth forecasts uh, and use that to generate the next scenario. Obviously, this is where climate change information comes in as well. So we're going to repeat that for all of the scenarios and document those. That will leave us with a set of scenarios to evaluate. And just to give you some examples from Eastern Shore, um, we went out looking and we, we got some sea level rise and um, marsh migration information. Uh, we got county um, plan information. Um, we had some conservation information from, from uh, some green infrastructure. Uh, planning work that had been done. So all of these different types of information can be brought together. And this diagram illustrates how that's done. This is uh, with our VISTA software, but certainly something somebody could repeat manually. Um, with VISTA, we have two attributes. We have what we call a feature type or a land use intent type that is defining what's happening on the ground, I should say, uh, in the water, or in the air, uh, and causal types of what's causing it to happen sort of policy mechanisms and, and principles like succession or drivers like climate change, we're going to get many, many different data sources representing uh, different uh, land stewards and sectors. Uh, we're going to bring those together and we're going to crosswalk those and integrate those um, and output what we call a uh, land use type map and a policy type map. And that's going to be done for each of our scenarios. And just an example from uh, Sheldon Hart. I won't spend a lot of time on this because uh, Ian Varley is going to show us some on the Georgia coast. But um, here we have our 20 year 2025 scenario incorporating current land management and uh, proposed end of grazing on Sheldon. So brown indicates horse grazing. Um, and there's a proposal to uh, eliminate that on the refuge. We're going to have uh, current urban and agricultural uses as well as current and future infrastructure. Uh, we have a, a uh, proposed, I believe this is a transmission, new transmission corridor for renewable energy getting put through uh, as well as future renewable energy development. Uh, so that's uh, spatially what a um, cumulative scenario might look like. Then we're going to evaluate our scenario effects. Now we're into step four. So we're going to conduct a spatial intersect and analyses to determine the scenario effects on resources that might be uh, running out to our toolkit to different tools to uh, be doing specific models of effects. We're going to generate output maps indicating uh, where our resources might be lost or have reduced condition. We're going to also generate tabular reports for the resource impacts. Uh, really focused on our quantitative goal achievement. Um, and then we're going to, of course, review all of this um, among the experts and conduct whatever uh, revisions are needed. So um, an example, this again is the Nature Serve Vista model. We've got our element distributions, also resource distributions, so the features we want to assess. We have our scenario maps. We're going to intersect these things together. Uh, we might do some basic categorical lookups to um, how elements respond uh, in a negative, neutral, beneficial way to different uh, things occurring in these scenarios, or we might um, go to a condition modeling function within VISTA, and then we're going to look up how we're doing on our element retention goals and export out a variety of maps and, and quantitative reports. And again, uh, Ian will show us uh, some of that live. Um, and that's where we're at right now. So um, I'll go ahead and let Sarah uh, move the presenter over to Ian, and then we'll come back and talk about uh, stressors, um, or sorry, uh, how to develop strategies and um, alternatives. And um, then we'll go ahead and, and see another demo, and then we'll wrap up after that. 
Okay, hi everyone. Um, Sarah, do I, can you hear me all right? Yep, we can hear you great, Ian. Okay, and you can see my screen. Um, all right, well, um, howdy everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to take you through um, a tour of an area that we've looked at uh, for for much of the same um, types of, of, of things that we've been talking about in this in this presentation in terms of integrating these um, cumulative effects analyses with, with a climate change component. Um, and this particular area that we're looking at right now is, is a, the section of coastal Georgia. If you can all picture in your minds, there's a short section of, of Atlantic coast that uh, the state of Georgia has, and we're um, between the states of South Carolina and Florida. And we partnered our, uh, we partnered with um, with Georgia Department of Natural Resources here and a number of other local partners to conduct some some analyses in this area. And um, so I'm going to take you through this project and explain to you some of the things that we did and some of the assumptions that we made and some of the uh, the conclusions that we've come to um, in in this context. So uh, what you're looking at, of course, is is um, ArcMap. Uh, this is uh, the version nine. Uh, point three, and uh, we do use the Nature Service uh, software to to manage a lot of this information. It's it's a pretty convenient way to do these sort of uh, cumulative effects analysis, where we have a lot of, of element information, or um, in other words, we have a lot of natural resources that we're looking at, and then we have a lot of, of scenario uh, types that we're managing in terms of different assumptions about what's happening now and different assumptions about what might happen in the future. Um, this is a, a regional project, and as Patrick mentioned, um, one of the, the neat things that we do in these, these assessments for refuges is, is typically look at a larger region. Um, some refuges are quite small, and they're actually quite dependent on, on, a, on a surrounding context that we've, we either look at an ecoregion scale and we'll look at the surrounding landscape that we've called it. So this might be a good um, surrounding landscape or an ecoregion type um, area that we'd want to kind of assess what's going on in this larger region and how does that affect what we're, what, what's important to us um, in in the in the refuge and, our, and around the refuge for conservation. Um, so within this context um, of the region, we um, developed a smaller project that uh, focuses on a much narrow area um, that we're going to be looking at. This is Camden County, uh, which is the smaller area within the coastal. Area so up here up north here you have Savannah Georgia in the town of Brunswick and just off the map here is actually uh, the city of Jacksonville Florida so again to give you a little bit more of orientation in terms of what we're looking at um, and we're going to be focusing on this county right down here picturing it which is Camden and I have a separate project that I'll bring up that will reflect that all right come on there we are. Um, so this is Camden County, Georgia, and we've done this uh, kind of focused project to get a cleaner view about what's, um, what's happening here and, and what we want to protect. And um, let me explain you some of these colors so we can kind of get ourselves oriented. As Patrick mentioned, um, we uh, develop a types of these scenarios through assumptions about what's happening with land use and land cover. And um, so uh, obviously what we have here are, uh, is a system of open water and estuarine and riverine areas that are um, the Atlantic coast um, in blue. Um, the next color that jumps out of us is this sort of uh, tannish color, which are all of the salt marshes, of which Georgia is blessed with a lot of them, um, that are in, in fairly good and well-functioning shape. As we get more inland, um, you'll see this kind of funny mosaic uh, of brown and a light green color. And those are typically what we're interested in um, in terms of their conservation value uh, for upland areas, and that's this mosaic of, of uh, of active silviculture areas or pine plantations that are very common if anyone's driven through uh, much of South Carolina, Georgia, northern Florida, uh, that are very common on the landscape. And then in between this, for whatever reason, areas that have been pine have, have haven't been uh, planted with pine. And these are the areas of, of often there there are wetland areas, but there are many upland areas as well that are sort of a mix of of um, older forests um, and and uh, natural forests that have been. Um, kind of held on through the years, and that's typically where a lot of the biodiversity, at least the upland biodiversity, is located in these areas, an area that was a particular focus for conservation. Um, we have a couple of protected areas in this area. Most uh, significantly, we have the uh, Cumberland Island National Seashore, which is this, our large area over here on the right, and then we have um, a couple of state uh, protected areas, the Crooked River State Park. Um, it's part of the, the Kings Bay Submarine Base area here um, near St. Mary's, Georgia, and then we have a couple of inland areas on the left. Uh, these are uh, Satilla River protected forest lands that are typically managed either by the, the, the university or often by the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Um, 
So our assumptions about this is, this, is if you flew over right now um, over the coastal Georgia and, and put a lens on that allowed us to look at what is our, our land use intent, what are the direct threats to biodiversity um, captured by the land use there, then, then what, what would this look like? So this is what we're looking at now. This is more or less what uh, this area looks like right now. And then we've, we've created different scenarios that allow us to peek into the future. A couple of those are um, some of the, the, the most significant changes that are, are geared up for the, this uh, area of coastal Georgia. Areas are called develop, uh, these developments of regional impact, and they're all they're sort of like a, um, planned unit developments, for those of you who are familiar with that term. But the large areas that have been reserved for development or have been applied for for development, but that the intentions are not very clear in terms of, well, these areas could be developed into uh, industrial purposes that could be developed into residential purposes. I mean, we are close to South Florida, areas of Savannah, so it's not unthinkable that these areas would be developed for, uh, for golf courses and, and communities as, as well as industrial areas. There's actually a lot of industry in the southern area of, um, of Georgia. So these areas, what we've done is, is just assume that these areas are developed to residential, but we could assume um, any number of things that these areas these are converted to industrial, uh, these are converted to other commercial uses. Um, Really, to, to biodiversity, this doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, uh, pavement is pavement, and, and most of the things that we're interested in tracking, uh, most of the natural resources are, um, they are they're sensitive, they're rare, they're imperiled, they're endemic. They're not going to do very well, whether it's a factory or whether it's a golf course. Both of them are going to have a tough time uh, persisting in a long-term fashion. Um, the other assumptions that we brought in here, we've made some different um, assumptions about, well, um, what are some additional areas that could be developed additional build-out areas, uh, not to see a lot of differences, but more in kind of an interior development here. And then finally, the one that we're particularly interested in, in this context is this uh, sea level rise areas with, uh, with the development combined. Because that's where, when we're looking to plan with a refuge or a, or a, a manager of natural resources, it doesn't make sense for us to just look at um, climate change effects. We also want to add in these um, areas of development and areas that are going to be at risk of land use change in the future so that we can get a, a more accurate and more robust picture of what might happen in the future and what we need to be planning for right now. With each of one of these scenarios, we compare these uh, with our biodiversity elements. And um, we've got a lot of them here. Uh, Georgia DNR did a fantastic job of mapping uh, what are a lot of uh, communities and associations, so very detailed habitat and vegetation maps for the area. And then we can sum this up with, stuff, with other information that comes out of uh, natural heritage inventories in terms of where, are these, where do we know that these um, uh, elements, these, 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 these very specific points where rare plants or animals might be, might be living. And so we can summarize this information um, here in these, in these um, yeah, what we call these conservation value summaries. Um, we can look at these individually here um, as well. But we'll take this information and we, we do sort of a smart intersection in VISTA. We'll come up with um, a scenario evaluation. And we're evaluating each scenario um, against uh, these different sets of, of biodiversity information. And this is what one of these looks like uh, for the current scenario. So we've got areas um, where we have elements. We have these things that are tracking that are appearing in this sort of tannish color. And then areas where there are currently conflicts with the land use, and we'll see these pop out in areas of red. Where, we, where there is no color, we don't have anything that we're tracking, we don't have any elements. Um, so you'll see, well definitely we have some conflicts currently right now with um, uh, along roadways, maybe some development areas that have kind of encroached into uh, places that we know where, where sensitive species are. Uh, this is an area where we have, um, we have you know, definitely uh, maritime forests, um, Eastern indigo snake, a threatened species in the area, and gopher tortoise, another uh, kind of keystone species that's important to the upland areas and uh, has a kind of a, an interesting relationship with the snake. And then, of course, there's salt marshes and tidal swamps, another great places for biodiversity in the area. These uh, evaluations get more interesting um, as we go into the future. And we see that as these areas get developed, we have more and more conflicts uh, with the biodiversity resources. That makes, makes sense. So areas that have previously been um, slated for, for this development possibility are now appearing in this bright red color. You can see that overlapping here. Um, areas that are not 
uh, or at least we don't expect there to be as much development pressure because of these, um, because there are no these there there are not uh, planned developments there, um, are are still relatively fine. Uh, so you'll see these these red areas pop out. Um, and then finally, um, we've made some assumptions about, as we've shown before, about sea level rise. We got some, some great data uh, that the Georgia DNR produced in conjunction with the University of Georgia, the River Basin Center, that is a SLAM model. This is sea level affecting marshes model. And so what I've done is, is uh, created a sort of simplified classification areas that we um, expect to turn into open water, sort of the bath lab idea. Well, what is just going to be covered with water? That's uh, those areas popping out in blue. And then what are those areas that we expect some sort of, uh, of sea, seawater intrusion? So we see those, these areas converting from what was, what was either uh, dry land to, um, to water or, or more specifically um, areas that may have been freshwater wetlands that are now becoming salty. And so those are the areas that we're specifically interested a lot with these, a lot of these coastal communities. Um, so if I flip between these two, you can see and compare um, you know, what the, the magnitude of change that we're looking at in these two areas. So a lot of development potential and then a lot of areas um, that we would expect to see some flooding and or salt intrusion um, as these, some of these uh, freshwater habitats are converted to salt. Um, and I'll show you a compatibility conflict map. Again, these are our scenario evaluations. We've got a lot more problems, and we're still sorting out some things with uh, Georgia DNR in terms of what's compatible with what. But but these are the areas that in the next short demo, as uh, after Patrick uh, explains a little more of our, our methods here, um, we'll go in here and we'll look for uh, we'll kind of zoom in on this area in the center, and I'll be uh, touring you through an area where we might try to do some mitigation in terms of looking at places to avoid, looking at places to um, to, uh, to maybe create offsite mitigation. So um, I'm going to turn this back over to Patrick, and he'll continue with the presentation. Actually, and before we uh, transfer over, uh, I see that you have the scenario evaluation report up. Do you just want to show that quickly? Yeah, I can show one of these. Um, what one of the really nice things about uh, Nature Servista is that it does um, makes the reporting of these uh, very easy. So we, we've, we've seen the spatial assumptions and the spatial outputs from this in terms of these compatibility conflict maps, um, but this uh, will also produce these reports that we can, um, they're all hyperlinked, we can, we can jump in here and look at any one of these uh, elements on the left and see how it performs under different scenarios. So I can bring up multiple of these and, and, and show them side by side. Well, this is what, this is what we'd expect uh, how our elements to perform in a current scenario. This is how I would expect our elements to perform under a future scenario, and we can track our level of goal retention, because without that level of goal retention, we're not not sure how, how how much success we're having or how much how much failure we're having. Um, so these uh, scenario options or these scenario reports um, help us help us track that information. Okay, thanks, Ian. Okay, I'll uh, switch over to you now, Patrick. Patrick, you're very faint right now. Okay, uh, lift up. Okay, so moving along. Um, can you see my screen now? I can't see your screen, and you're still a little faint, but it's much better. But if you could speak okay. up, that would be great. Right. You said you can see the screen? Uh, I can see the screen, yes. Okay, okay. So um, what Ian was just showing was um, using what, what's a relatively easy uh, assessment uh, to make using uh, results from the SLAM model, not suggesting what SLAM does is at all simple, but bringing that into a framework uh, method and tool like uh, VISTA, uh, uh, is pretty straightforward to assess those effects, but I wanted to indicate there's other work um, to do with climate change effects, and uh, I just wanted to show a couple slides from work that our Oregon Natural Heritage Program is doing with us on our Sheldon Hart Refuge Project. Um, it doesn't need to be limited to the interior. Anywhere where there's vegetation, uh, you're going to uh, probably be interested in what might happen uh, with your vegetation over time. So this is indicating that there's a global dynamic vegetation model uh, indicating change potential. And then uh, there's this tool VDDT that um, is used to model the different successional stages of vegetation and what might happen under um, different management influences. 
So uh, the little graph there um, is indicating over time, this is actually a 300 year time frame, um, and on the um, Y axis we have the percent of area covered by a group of different vegetation types. What might happen to those in terms of their percent um, coverage um, over that 300 year time frame? So that's, that's the basic idea of modeling that vegetation. And then here's an example of using VDDT to evaluate uh, effects of different uh, grazing management approaches um, in this uh, particular watershed of our supporting landscape. And this is over 100 year, 150 year time frame with climate change. So we have a scenario uh, where grazing would continue and a scenario where grazing would be removed. Uh, y axis again, percent of cover. These are, you can't read these probably, but these are different vegetation types, the different colors. And then we have this 150 year time scale. So starting point is the same, um, obviously on each one of these, but we can see very different modeled trajectories of what's going to happen to vegetation um, under climate change and in the presence of grazing or no grazing. This red in particular is uh, cheatgrass, a, a very damaging exotic um, annual grass species, and you can see it going from a minor component to the dominant um, component in that watershed over that time frame, and, and happening fairly quickly, by the way. All right, so mo moving on. Um, after we've done our scenario evaluations, we are going to look at those results from step four and determine, you know, is action even needed? Uh, maybe we're doing fine the direction we're heading in. Uh, if it's needed, um, why? What, what needs attention and what's causing the need for the attention? So we're going to start off, you know, having those kind of discussions. We're going to identify the key stressors and evaluate our ability to mitigate those. Some of them may not be mitigatable. Uh, and then I just want to mention there is an upcoming resource um, under our cooperative agreement with the service. Uh, we are developing a uh, best practices for adaptation uh, online uh, resource. So um, getting in a little deeper on the strategies, um, very much about following the mitigation hierarchy. We want to avoid future stressors by removing or relocating them where we can. We want to minimize um, through timing or design of the stressor. We want to restore condition or recreate habitat. Or we want to offset by conserving or restoring in a different location other than where the impact is happening. So that's all pretty traditional uh, mitigation hierarchy. And again, the idea um, in the literature about um, climate adaptation is first thing is minimize all the current stressors that you possibly can because that will give your resources more resiliency uh, to the climate changes that are happening. So you also might conclude that a resource is capable of adapting, either assisted or non-assisted. Um, or you may conclude that no mitigation or adaptation is feasible. Maybe uh, you're simply going to have the climate envelope for your resource shift out of your area and uh, you can't do anything about that other than uh, perhaps plan for the migration, um, depending on what that resource is. Um, so working collaboratively through the landscape to ensure a uh, compatible um, migration corridor exists. I um, just wanted to drop a quick example. Um, this is from the city of Chula Vista. We didn't have anything to do with this, but uh, I thought that was, this was kind of nifty that the city is in California. Um, has gone through a pretty lengthy process and developed a report uh, on how they plan to adapt to climate change. And um, here's just a screenshot um, out, out of their report. And so, uh, you know, they talk about uh, cooperation with resource agencies, the importance of monitoring and restoring, um, also incorporating adequate upland or transition habitats to accommodate shifts in wetlands. So the, these are what we think about strategies, written strategies, identifying what the issue is and what um, possibly could be done to address it. Um, so once you have those strategies, again, we want to develop some actual alternatives uh, for that. So first step is documenting what resources and stressors won't be addressed as infeasible and why. So you can kind of set those aside. Then we want to integrate our non-spatial strategies into a description of alternatives for future action and then forward our spatial strategies into alternative scenario development. And so here's an example back to uh, Sheldon Hart. 
in under this proposal, all this area that used to be brown um, of horse grazing, there's now a proposal for compatible uh, management. Doesn't mean expanding the refuge, but compatible management on these lands um, to increase the goal retention for resources. And, and so in particular, things like the antelope um, populations for which these refuges were established um, by Congress actually migrate um, between these, so trying to establish a uh, compatible managed uh, migration corridor is, is one important objective. All right, so then we're going to hop back to Ian. He's going to show us a little bit uh, more live work of um, uh, thinking about impacts, um, you know, both on development from climate change as well as uh, impacts from development. and and uh, just a sense of what somebody might do using these tools to uh, uh, deal with that problem. Okay, back to Ian. Let's see. All right, you're now presenter, Ian. Thanks. Um, all right, so when we left off, we were, we were zooming in on an area uh, in Camden County in southern Georgia here uh, for a quick um, for a, a demo of, of what um, a mitigation process might look like in this area. But before we did that, uh, I wanted to um, show everyone a, um, another tool, another, yeah, another output of another tool that, that we've used to, um, to kind of help get a handle on, on what's most important in the area. Area and as Patrick mentioned earlier, we're a big proponent of a toolkit of using different tools to help us answer uh, some fairly complicated questions. And uh, so what we've got, we did, um, we amassed so much uh, biodiversity information and assumptions about land use and so forth. This made it very easy to uh, to run MarkSan, which you can actually run, uh, create the inputs for out of Nature Service Vistas. So it makes uh, running MarkSan quite easy. Um, and so we, we've created a couple of different assumptions um, out of MarkSan, and, and I'm going to show you two of those here. Um, this is a sum of solutions output, and so what we're seeing here is that uh, MarkSan works in a way where we are, it, 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 uh, through a process called simulating annealing, which we're not going to get into, but it, um, it is a fairly good tool for identifying places with relative irreplaceability. What are the places that are, would be most difficult to replace if, um, if these were damaged, and it helps us make um, better assumptions about what areas are the most valuable for for conservation. And we created two of these portfolios, these Mark portfolios, for um, for the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. And one of these is what you're looking at right here. This is called the low risk portfolio. We have two sets of goals. One set of goals um, is set very high. We call this the low risk, and that's because it's the low risk of losing our biodiversity resources. Um, and then we have a high risk scenario, and this is, um, put this one up on top, and these sets the, our goal levels a little bit lower. So what if our goals are a little lower and it sets a higher risk for, for losing our biodiversity, but it gets a better sense in terms of uh, being able to prioritize some areas in this, in this landscape for protection. Um, this might be um, a different way to look at it. And so we can create sets of these and come up with areas and, and of, of um, that are, are particularly that, that stand out a lot for, for biodiversity protection in this regional context. And this helps, has helped us inform um, our assumptions about what's happening at this county level. Before I go there, Park, um, or, um, Patrick, do you have any more, uh, anything to add about MarkSan and, and how we're using it here? Um, no, I think that's, that's sufficient context. We can move on. Okay. Okay, so I've switched back over here to um, uh, this county project. Again, we're focused in an area that is bordered by a lot of, of um, got an area um, that's uh, this, this, this very sensitive interface right now with um, the salt marshes. We've got some inlet areas here creeping up into the um, and estuarine areas that are that are important, and then um, this mosaic of of uh, pine plantation with upland and wetland areas of, of more or less what is natural or native forest. Um, Vista has a tool called the Site Explorer, which allows us to go into these areas and and look and see what's what is what is in particular is causing um, you know the problems. Um, this is the scenario evaluation of this scenario that's looking not just at uh, these developments of regional impact, but also the sea level rise and so what what might happen. Um, in this scenario, and um, so let me, oops, I didn't turn that on here. There we are. 
and we can see this. So again, where we see these red colors and pink colors, we've got um, conflicts with this future land use, either sea level rise or developments, and so we'd want to probably approach um, this with the idea that that um, that refuges and uh, in probably in context with local governments and other natural resources would want to work with uh, a potential developer in this area to I to ID area find places where we would want to avoid um, we want to avoid impacts and especially avoid impacts that um, not just with the, with the development, but also with the sea level rise and the, the potential uh, expansion of the saltwater communities as that sea level rises. Um, let's see here. Ooh. So this is Site Explorer, and this allows us to take a quick inventory of what's happening in the area that I've selected here in red. Um, to give a sense of the scale of this area, each one of these, um, each one of these, these grid cells is 100 meters by 100 meters. Um, so a fairly large area where we're experiencing some, um, some sea level rise in these inland spots. And so I can select an area here and very quickly go in and see, well, what are the, what are the conflicts that I see in this area? Um, a couple of things jump out that are that are pretty important. We've got this uh, sand laurel oak, sand live oak hammock. This is a priority vegetation community for Department of Natural Resources. Outer coastal plain maiden cane con, another one. Um, this Atlantic coastal fringe evergreen forest. Um, some other areas that um, we can see using these compatible. Oops, shouldn't have clicked on that. Um, by interpreting this graph, I can take a look and see. Well, there's obviously there's there's not a lot of it um, of this in in general. There's only 4.9 acres, um, all of which are located within the selected area. So these are very priority, and this is a this would be a key area for conservation of this uh, of this particular resource. Um, but what this graph is is telling us is 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 giving us an idea of what's the goal level um, set for each one, and then how much of it is present on how much of the distribution is present on in this particular selected area and how much what's our bang for our buck how much is really here and 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 how much does this site contribute to our goal level so we see with these dark these bright colors that that these contribute quite a bit or or they're capable of contributing it, but they're capable of contributing they're not contributing right now because we've got a conflict but 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 yes exactly as patrick mentioned these are areas that are capable of contributing a lot of this um, uh, and so i can take this and Oh, this is kind of hampered by my size here. And once this is up, you can actually switch between areas um, pretty readily. We could switch to other areas that don't have as much conflict. I can get these areas that are not um, where you see less problems that, that you could potentially uh, approach a developer with and say, well, these are areas where we don't have as many natural resources, and these would be areas that you could direct um, you could direct development towards. Um, now what we see here is, um, and it's not coming out very, very well in this particular visualization, but we've got a, a, a fringe of area that is, that is basically being inundated with saltwater communities, and we could expect to you know, potentially lose these communities if um, during a, in a sea level rise community and, and with, a, with a development side, with additional development in the area, this could be a, a potential risk here for, for We'd want to give this a little room to to expand in the case of, of and, and move if if that's what what it needs here. So, in other words, what we're forecasting is that we've got sea level rise pushing the marsh migration up upland, um, and it would get squeezed by this area if it was developed. So, we've got the dual problem of development. Uh, would have immediate near-term impacts um, on a lot of the biodiversity and, and some of it endemic within the county. Um, and then um, as climate changes and it's trying to move some of these saltwater uh, communities um, upstream or upslope, they're going to run into the brick wall literally of development. So we have a, a dual problem going on. 
Um, and this is Sarah, and I'm just going to pipe in. For those of you who have to leave at the hour, this is an hour and a half webinar. Um, just if you want to see a recording so you can see the end of the webinar, just shoot me an email. It's Sarah underscore Carr at natureserve.org. But uh, this webinar will continue for another half an hour. Okay. Go back to you, Ian. Okay, thanks. Um, Vista has a handy uh, um, <clears throat> function that here that allows us to play with the with the land use um, relatively quickly. So if we wanted to to propose um, to a developer or to the county government that we were working for that this would be an area that we would want to set aside for conservation to allow. Um, as Patrick mentioned, this, this shift in uh, allowing some sea level rise to occur, but also giving the, the resources sufficient room to prosper, um, we, could, we could propose this and uh, expand this out here a little bit. We could override this land use with a different land use and propose a conservation use. change this and um, we can relatively quickly get an idea of how much um, uh, how much area and 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 to what degree that contributes to our goals and and see what the conservation gain is by changing the land use from something that would be negative to something that would be positive for the for the uh, for the biodiversity and this takes just a second to, to run here. So the idea is you can go around site to site where you have these conflicts and you can propose these changes and then these you can save these out um, and integrate these back into a new alternative future scenario. So this is the way that uh, you can spatially build your alternatives. Uh, and then the, the other component we didn't use on this particular project, but there's also the policy side. So in addition to saying what physical change do you want to make in terms of land use, um, you know, removing a stressor or conducting restoration, whatever it is. Uh, you could also specify what is the mechanism you would like to use to achieve that. So it, it might be, you know, buy it. Um, it, it might be something uh, regulatory. Uh, could be landowner education. So you'd have the ability to create a fairly complete plan that says what do you want to do, where do you want to do it, and what mechanism do you want to use to actually implement that. Yeah, so this would be a great tool to, to work with a team um, to identify areas where you'd want to avoid and suggest areas that would be, that would be um, better for development. In, in some of these areas. So we could definitely I find areas that would be that there would be less conflict or no conflict would be ideal with but your biodiversity and suggest, well these are the, the areas that we would suggest for development um, based on what we know is here. And um, that would be maybe a first uh, line of defense or a um, first line of recommendations you could go through and present to a developer or a county government and say, well, you know, this is what we see would be a better way to develop in here. Um, and preserve a lot of the biodiversity resources that we have. So what we've done is we've changed, um, we've, created, we've transformed this area in red to a biodiversity use um, and, and hopefully would allow this for some area to, um, would allow this to, to, to survive and persist and wouldn't be transformed by, by, a, by a, uh, an urban land use, let's say, and we've now actually um, achieved our goals. Um, which is what uh, this, this tool helped us say. And so you see these areas that were once bright red pop up as bright green, and we see that, well, actually we've, we've added to a compatible area to our, um, our goals, and that, that has helped us uh, achieve those goals. So um, a pretty neat little tool. And again, you want to work with this in a, in a team setting and, and, and probably do numerous iterations of this um, with different scenarios and different assumptions and different desires, um, uh, stakeholder desires, and you could, you could do this pretty readily. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Patrick uh, for the, the, the last section of the, the webinar here. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just mention that to the reason we showed you the marks and results early on. That, uh, doing a uh, hit and miss, you know, we're just going to hunt around. To, I'm sorry, someone else could be getting a lot of heavy breathing. Um, the, uh, 
uh, issue of where do I actually look to efficiently mitigate these kind of problems, uh, that's an excellent use for MarkSan. It's going to give us that efficient set of places where we can do our conservation work. So, so in this example, the development we would be displacing from that particular site, we could look at our regional MarkSan results and go to that site and propose you know, maybe it's a forestry use now proposed, you know, actually to develop it and likewise on the fly see what sort of impacts that might cause. Would, we, would that actually be a maladaptive response to do that? Would we, in other words, would we cause more problems than we solve? So uh, that's, you know, generally the approach of that loop. Okay, um, and Sarah, is my screen back up? It is, and if you could speak up a teeny bit. Okay. Um, so I just want to conclude, you know, last few slides here with um, this last step here. We've informed the alternatives, but we need to export this off into the planning process now. And um, again, back to Chula Vista, just emphasizing, you know, they recognize there's a lot of different sectors that need to be involved in this work. And so that, uh, that's an important component of our framework is this idea of different sectors, different uh, locations, jurisdictions. Uh, doing this assessment and planning collaboratively across the landscape is obviously not required to do that. Um, any one uh, jurisdiction could uh, go ahead and perform this process, but uh, in terms of really understanding the effects uh, from things happening off-site um, from your jurisdiction um, and thinking about things like the need for, for uh, biodiversity to migrate over space and time with climate change, uh, it makes a lot of sense to think about this. So um, we do want to forward these results in the planning process. We want to provide results with some considerations. One is uh, how will people access the products and the source information. That's going to be important. Um, you're probably going to need interpretive materials. Um, you're going to have different levels of knowledge in different sectors that look at this stuff differently, have different jargon. So uh, reinterpreting the materials, uh, there needs to be an active outreach component to educate people about the results and the products. Uh, and then technical and scientific assistance in the use of these products simply, um, I think we all know that, just flinging stuff up on a download site um, has not worked, it's never worked. Uh, you really need to be able to provide that technical assistance in the use of these products, especially with climate change stuff where some of it's going to be novel. Um, and just an example, uh, I think a lot of people have seen this demo on the Coastal Resilience uh, for Long Island Sound project by TNC and its partners. Um, so this was a website um, that was developed um, that had a lot of interpretive information and a lot of interactive um, capability for people to bring up different scenarios and, and ask what if questions. That's, that's one part of those considerations of actually making this information available. Um, so what have we learned? Uh, um, so when we've done these, um, the RVA stands for Refuge Vulnerability Assessment. Um, we believe that probably doing these for a cluster of refuges, so if you're, if you're not with a refuge, you want to think about um, other units, maybe a, a group of towns. Um, so working on a cluster of these uh, can be conducted far more efficiently than for working on them individually. Uh, working over um, these landscapes um, is probably more appropriate for current climate data application because of the scale um, of it and the uncertainty than, uh, again, trying to apply it to a very small focused area. Um, we did encounter a lot of challenges working with planners and managers uh, to really understand um, the climate change issues to form the sort of assessment questions they want. So just indicating that that's going to take some time to work with people on what it is they really want to find out and what sort of products will actually help them in their decision making. And then doing the kind of detailed climate effects modeling like the couple examples I showed uh, from uh, our Sheldon Hart example is pretty complicated. It's pretty time and resource intensive. So that's really best done in collaboration with large institutions over a region, um, thinking about the new landscape conservation cooperatives as being you know, perhaps one of those vehicles for doing that kind of work. 
So um, that's our wrap up. Uh, the box there um, has some acknowledgments um, for all the different funding sources that went into this. Um, we're happy to take questions or your comments. Now I also have uh, some slides. Um, if we um, hit a slow spot, uh, we can talk about some of the trends in this sort of work and some of the challenges. But I'll go ahead and uh, uh, end our formal presentation and let Sarah uh, moderate some questions. Okay, thank you, Patrick, um, and, and thank you both, Ian and Patrick. This is a great presentation. Um, and Patrick, can you go ahead and put your contact information up in case anyone wants to get in touch with you? Um, so now is the time to send in questions, and I just uh, remind you again how to to ask questions, you can send them in by typing them into the question interface, or you can raise your virtual hand and I'll unmute you, and you can ask them directly, and we love this option when it works, um, but it only works if you have a working microphone and aren't muted, or if you're using the, uh, if you put in your PIN number for the conference call and you also aren't unmuted. Okay, um, great, so let's get started with some questions. Um, there was a question as to whether Vista uh, works with ArcGIS 10. Uh, not yet. Um, we are actively engineering that uh, right now, and we're hoping. Um, uh, I don't know, Ian. What I don't know if it, what's safe to say at the moment. Um, you can certainly keep visiting our website, NatureServeVista, or sorry, NatureServe.org/vista, um, and. Um, I think we're thinking maybe end of September. Okay. Hopefully before then. I think we can we can do this by I think we can get it done probably by, by the end of August, but but uh, September at the latest. Okay. And then there was a question. Um, let's see about whether Vista has been used outside the U.S., especially in Asia. Um, it's certainly been used outside the U.S. Um, Ian, I don't know if uh, if you are aware of Asian sourced um, registrants. Um, definitely, uh, we have registered users in Asia. Um, I don't know of any projects uh, that have been done in that region. We have, uh, you know, I know of projects in Europe and in South America, but but I don't know about any specifically in Asia. Um, yeah. So uh, being a free tool, we we have a, a something like fifteen hundred re registrants, we, we're hesitant to say registered users because when it's free and uh, people aren't ponying up, it's a little harder to, to detect if they're probably using it or not. Um, so we've done some recent uh, market surveys to try and get a little better handle on that. Okay, thanks. And let's see, we're going to go to the mics and see if that works for us. Uh, let's see, I'm going to unmute. Vera, are you there? No, okay. Vera, I'll, I'll try one more time. Did you have a question, Vera? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks for a great presentation. I have two questions. One of them is a, a sort of a smaller focus question, and that is, um, you know, I'm curious about how your potential build-out uh, for areas was developed that, that layer, and that's sort of the, the first question. The second one is, um, from your presentation, I get the sense that you know you obviously have some great, great information on you know you're, you're trying to, to display some great information on people, uh, but a lot of how that's used, it's more sort of looking where people in nature may conflict and how to how to how to deal with that. And I'm wondering if, if I'm understanding that correctly. And I guess what I'm getting at is if you are also working at trying to highlight how nature can protect people. Uh, right. So let's see. Um, in terms of build out, I won't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, Vista itself doesn't do any modeling of, say, urban growth forecasts. That's something that is handled through the toolkit by a tool like Community Viz or What If, uh, Places 3. I mean, there's a whole ton of tools out there that do those kind of forecasts. So we would simply import those in and integrate those into a VISTA scenario and then assess them. Um, in terms of uh, nature protecting people, um, I assume you're referring to, say, you know, if you retain um, the salt marshes, um, is that going to provide a protective 
effect. Um, you know, you could, um, we haven't dealt with that in, in this particular toolkit. Um, you know, I, I think there's a a lot of vagary about the science of that. Now, I've certainly read articles that are bringing into question some of those assumptions. That, again, if you were talking about that specific example, um, so you know, there that would be, I'd say, a specialized analysis to do something like that. Um, we certainly have a lot of focus in the way Vista works about recognizing compatibility, not just conflicts. So there is a process of doing an expert scoring approach of how do, does each resource relate um, to each of the uh, components of a scenario, um, just looking at a list of those things, and recognizing those ones that are neutral or even beneficial, for example. Okay, great. Thank you. That, that uh, exactly answers my question. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you both. And let's try John now. John, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, interested in your thoughts regarding um, the appropriateness of uh, up, um, upland system assessments of something like uh, natural gas extraction uh, for something like the Marcellus Shale, and whether or not any 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 of those kinds of um, projects have been uh, undertaken so far. Uh, well, I'm not sure quite what you're getting at it if you're talking about sort of a, a uh, geological chemical sort of analysis. Is well, if you, if you combine the uh, natural resource slash ecological slash water assessment to say like if you were to look at the long term or the, the, the short term long term impacts of the, the physical disturbance, the ecological disturbance and potentially the uh, both surficial as well as groundwater impacts on natural gas extraction use in, in this case look, looking at the frac looking specifically at fracking high, you know uh, high pressure fra uh, fracturing um, and the long term impacts or well, short and long term impacts of what that how that would affect those systems the natural system ecosystem biodiversity and water quality yeah well I'll say that that level of uh, analysis specialized analyses is not something that that we at nature sort of have gotten into uh, that sort of a thing is certainly something that can be included in the framework that we've described. So anytime you want to introduce uh, a land use of some sort uh, and then assess it against what, what resource it would be, but that would be again reaching out to a pretty specialized component of the toolkit that would be capable of doing all of the hydrogeologic types of modeling necessary for something like that. John, does that answer your question? Sorry, that's the best I can okay. do. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I think we lost John. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Then the next question, what was the magnitude of effort in terms of time and dollars that went into the Georgia project? How many folks were involved? Well, um, you know, it, it was something that could have been done from a technical perspective much quicker than it took, I, I would say. You know, if we had started after all of the data development that the agency was doing, uh, you know, we probably could have run through it in you know six months. But uh, again, I think everybody recognizes um, there's humans involved, and uh, uh, working through all of the processes uh, necessary, all of the expert knowledge gathering, and all of that um, took a while. Took a lot of people. Um, I would uh, hazard to guess that um, you know a couple dozen two to three dozen people uh, total were involved in it. And from a technical perspective, most of the scientific and technical work was done by oh, probably four to five people. Um, and um, dollar-wise, I'm trying to remember, I think it was around a couple hundred thousand dollars for, uh, for the technical work. And there was certainly a lot of work done by the, the state agency um, and other agencies that they, they did out of their own dime, so uh, that's not included in that figure. Uh, other projects, uh, uh, you know, for example, the refuge projects, those were costing around $100,000 a piece individually. Um, we did a more recent estimate of doing a whole cluster of them uh, in a landscape. 
um, for you know only about 50 percent more to do a whole you know do a bunch of them rather than you know the, the same cost over and over again. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, let's see. There's another question. Does Vista, or is there another tool to do this process in the coastal ocean um, that is put in known species and process data, such as census of marine life uh, data, knowledge from fishermen, et cetera, and model change in the ocean from climate change, such as changing water temperatures, currents, acidification, overfishing? Um, you know, we don't do a lot of work in marine. We've applied VISTA um, in a few places looking at both uh, the terrestrial and the marine systems. Um, and, um, you know, using the relatively simple data model of, uh, you know, is this a compatible use? Um, sometimes getting into more complex things in the land sea toolkit of, of doing um, water quality modeling and bringing that in as an ecological condition model into VISTA. You know, we've done some of those things, um, but in terms of uh, doing some, you know, real big scale marine, you know, modeling marine changes, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's some stuff out there that falls out of my uh, area of knowledge. I think um, Sarah wants to open it up and there's some other people on the call that want to respond. That would be fine. Uh, you can use Vista for that. Uh, Vista, like a lot of other decision support systems, um, you know, isn't well designed to deal with that. The high level of dynamics in the marine uh, world right now. There's some real specialized tools that have been built, but in terms of a real full-blown uh, framework decision support system, there there aren't really any that I'm aware of that that deal with that that kind of dynamism. Um, and I was just going to add, Sally Ann, this is a great question for our EBM Tools Network listserv. We have several thousand people on the listserv with uh, uh, amazing knowledge of what tools exist right now, uh, particularly for coastal and marine environments. So um, if you're not already on it, Sally, uh, you can get in touch with me, Sarah Carr, at NatureServe. Sarah underscore Carr at NatureServe.org, and we can talk about uh, how you could pose that query uh, to the listserv, because I, th I think that those folks could let you know uh, the range of, of possibilities tools that are out there. Okay, and let's see, we have a question. Um, what is the present climate change information resolution? Is it homogenous for all the world? What's the minimum scale needed to run the application? Well, I'll start with the latter. There is no minimum scale. That's something really that you define during that scoping process where you talk about the scenarios you want to evaluate and what's feasible, and that gets very iterative with your data evaluation. So really that first step of scoping and second part of evaluating data are, are somewhat concurrent, somewhat iterative. Um, so you're going to say, here's what we'd like to do. Let's look at the data. Oops, you know, data is not a good fit, and we don't have budget to develop data. Let's go back to scoping. So um, answering the bigger question, there's certainly global homogenous uh, climate change data sets. Um, you know, what scale is it now? I think you can probably get 15 kilometer globally. Um, there are certainly sets um, that I've heard of stuff pushed down to two kilometer, but at that level, the climate folks I know get very nervous about if you've overshot the reliability because all of the downscales begin with the global models. Um, so you're really downscaling the global data, uh, which is quite coarse, and you need a lot of um, uh, weather stations um, in the region to be able to calibrate it properly to a good downscale. So um, I, I still tend to hear things like, you know, four kilometer where you've got really good dense weather station information, um, and, and then, you know, otherwise maybe sort of eight, eight to 12 kilometer is more appropriate. Um, and this is where, you know, you have to really think through the problem of how are you going to use that data that is appropriate to its scale. And I, it's kind of a, too lengthy for me to get into uh, right now, but, um, you know, there are sources of information um, really starting to be developed out there at some of the different data sets. So I'd, I'd probably look at, say, you know, uh, kcax.org and, and search and see um, what sort of information you find about that uh, in a location like that. 
Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, there's a question. Once the project for Sheldon Hart was completed, how did the refuge use the conclusions? Uh, for example, did the different scenarios actually lead to different management actions or decisions? Um, that question is easy to answer because uh, we are delivering the final report this Friday. So, uh, so they have seen preliminary um, results and, and actually that one uh, adaptation sort of uh, response scenario or alternative future scenario. Um, they saw an earlier version and they actually gave some input that ended up revising that. So, so they've already been engaged um, with it the, you know, the whole time we've been working on it. Um, the intent is to use it in developing their comprehensive conservation plan. So um, all, all of the scoping, everything has been designed around that, so um, that that is how we expect they're going to use it. Um, as well, they're very interested in VISTA. Um, they already have it. We're going to install the project with them, so the intent is they will then use it more for their routine management decision making uh, and keeping it you know, current as an adaptive management toolkit. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, we still have two more minutes according to my watch. We just have two quick questions. Um, how long do you think the slides, remaining slides you had, Patrick, would take? Or the additional slides, I should oh, say. Um, a couple minutes. Uh, did you want to want to show those? Uh, I, I, I can. Um, so, and I, I won't read all this in detail, but I'll just give people some highlights. You know, I, I just wanted to jot down some things that both excite and frustrate climate change practitioners and researchers. Um, part is there's, there's this evolution of thinking, and one is, you know, realization that, hey, you know, every species on Earth right now has been through climate change. Uh, so it's not an issue of, you know, do they have that ability to adapt? It's more about, again, this issue of do they have the room to adapt? And, and you know, there's a lot of question about the speed. I mean, some, some of the... Um, the climate change records um, through history, you know, have shown that there have actually been some extremely rapid climate changes that have happened in nature. Um, so the adaptation might be there. So a lot of research going on with that. Um, you know, someone had asked, asked about salt marsh. I, I think I kind of covered that one um, before. And you know, there's this whole thing about invasive species and real strong in, uh, emphasis about dealing with invasive species over the last few decades in land management. Um, you know, with climate change, you know, people are starting to have that second look of, well, maybe my invasive species is just something that's adapting, and my place is actually going to become, you know, a strong point of the survival of that species. So I think people have to start to take a closer look. Uh, you know, obviously, if it's something that came over in a shipping crate from Asia is one issue um, versus you know, something that's that's moved up from maybe an area a few hundred miles away. So people have to think hard about that. Um, and then, uh, let me just get over here if I can get this to work. Um, you know, we, we also have this uh, need for continuing integration among biodiversity and other sectors while avoiding those maladaptive responses. So understanding that, you know, ecological vulnerability assessment also needs to include planning for human safety, um, people are going to be protecting development and infrastructure investments um, that can lead to maladaptive responses. Um, there's a need for conservation planners to be involved. Um, there's going to be the need for potential human um, relocation. Um, again, all are issues that are going to be happening concurrently. Um, and then this other big factor is the timing of when you want to integrate your actions into your plans and act on them relative to the uncertainty uh, in future forecasts, and I'll just click through this quickly, but the idea here is, you know, we have this current knowledge, and as time goes on, our knowledge against novel stressors, novel ecosystems goes down, down, down. What we need to be doing is filling in the other wedge here of future knowledge through research, monitoring, and adaptive management about how things are really interacting with climate change. But for planners, you know, you're working on your your plan for the next 15 years right now, what is, what is that 2075 um, forecast tell you for your plan right now? That's a big question, and we don't have the answer. That's something we're all struggling with, all of us together. 
right now, but it's thinking about these series of plans and maybe how those are interacting with future knowledge. Um, but you know, managers are asking that question now. What you know, you said I might lose something by 2060. Should I still be managing for it? So, any anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, thank you, Patrick, and we'll wrap up. Thank you again, uh, both Ian and Patrick. It was a great presentation. And again, if anybody wanted the recording, I can send it to you. It's Sarah underscore Carr at natureserve.org. And um, thank you all for participating. We really appreciate you coming and, and sticking in for an hour and a half. Okay, I hope everyone has a good afternoon Thanks, or, or morning, depending on where you are. All right, bye, everyone.